Hi, I'm David Garfield. Today, I'm sitting with a wonderful artist, vocalist, songwriter, instrumentalist, and author, Mr. David Philp. Thanks for being with me today. It's good to see you, David. Wonderful to be with you. And we have had the pleasure of collaborating on several musical endeavors, writing songs together, and also recording a cover of the great Beatle classic, Strawberry Fields, which has done really well. It's great. If you haven't heard it, you better get on YouTube and check it out. Let me take you down, cause I'm going to strawberry fields. We've had the pleasure of working together for some years now. I'd like to ask you a bunch of questions today and find out more about your backstory. Yeah. No hard ones. <laughs> no trick questions. <laughs> what got you interested in pursuing music, and how did you get into pursuing music? I was at a British boarding school, um, and everything was kind of dark in my life. And But, you know, at night I could pull up the covers and stick in my, my little headset and listen to Radio Luxembourg. And it was a time of really just amazing, you know, three-minute magic rock records. Each one was different in its own way, you know. It was new to me, but it was also new to everybody else because they were inventing this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, which made it especially, you know, exciting. That world became the only one that was real to me in my childhood. Place to go outside of the school doldrums, and be inspired and motivated. Yeah, and to isolate as well into, you know, bed covers over your head kind of world, you know. What kind of artists were you listening to then? Well, obviously, you know, the Beatles and Dylan. But, the, I mean, everybody had, you know, a great record in them. I particularly like, you know, the birds and that whole 12-string thing. Oh. You know? And, I was you know, a huge Birds fan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were fantastic. You know, they, they were the best of Laurel Canyon for me. Yeah. You know. So you were inspired by the Beatles, Bob Dylan, the Birds. Kinks. The Kinks. And um, where was this boarding school located? It was in the west country of England, in Cheltenham, which is the Cotswolds. Mm -hmm. Pretty, but it was another brutal paramilitary organisation. <laughs> really? Churning, churning out little bastards to rule the empire for, you know, 150 years or something. Did you have to wear a uniform? Oh, absolutely. Not just uniform. We had to wear, you know, those uh, mortarboards. Like a cap and gown? Well, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the thing, like, when, when you graduate, you throw it up in the air. We had to wear it. Every day? Yeah, whenever you went out. Oh, my gosh. But did you play music in school? Did they have a music program? They did, and I was not really part of it. Because, you know, I, I, I wasn't really into the kind of music they were teaching. You know, I was into this my own little world of... Mm. Radio Luxembourg and the headset. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, everybody who was musical or in musical education completely looked down their noses at rock and roll. I mean, my dad used to say, ah, oh, you know, those Beatles, oh, next year it'll be somebody else and they'll be over. But, you know, before my dad died, he said, you know, I listened to the Beatles the other night and I finally get it. That's great, man. Mm. So well, tell me, what was your first band, your first musical experience being in a band? Was it playing or singing or both? Well, the first band I, I kind of got involved with was a band called The Boys, who had a studio up in North London. Uh, you know, I wasn't with them for long, but in that little studio, the Pistols did their demos and the Dam did their demos. And, uh, and I did some demos. And I, I can quite honestly say that all of the demos done in that little studio sucked. <laughs> <laughs> but the boys introduced me to um, this guy who was an uh, he was a T boy at Phonogram Studios. 
but he was allowed to have acts in on dead time. This kid, he looked like he was 12, and his name was Steve Lillywhite. Steve Lillywhite mm. is the guy who was the producer of U2. Yes. And, uh, he did a lot of the great records of the 80s, you know, like The Pogues, XTC, Big Country. When you say T-Boy, what is that? That's like... He ran to get tea for the for the players? Yeah. Like we'd have Yeah, he wasn't boys. even really an engineer yet, you know. Right. Oh, really? You know, there were two Steves, Steve Brown and Steve Lillywhite. They were very, very junior engineers or, or mm -hmm. hoping to become engineers. And they worked on a bunch of other things that were going on at the time, including status quo. Roy Wood was another one. So I had Steve move into my apartment in West Kensington. And right at that point the whole punk thing exploded. But we weren't entirely, you know, we weren't properly punk. I mean, Steve's other band was Ultravox, although they were called Tiger Lily at the time. Uh -huh. So when, when you started the Automatics, how did that come about? Well, I'd been doing these solo things with Steve in Dead Time on Phonogram, but I felt like I needed a band. So I put together the Automatics. Mm -hmm which was a long, drawn-out process because you didn't just want people who could sort of play. <laughs> they had to look good as well, you know. Right. And then we had a bass player. Finally, we got the bass player, you know, and he was great, and then he disappears. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, he showed up on the front cover of NME <laughs> <laughs> with another band. So uh. that's the vagaries of... The wild and wacky world of rock and roll, David. We were sort of oscillating on dead time at Phonogram. Things kind of took off from there. You know, we got the residency at the Marquee Club. The Marquee uh, Club in London? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I played there once. Oh, yeah, well, I played there plenty of times. Oh, we had gosh. a residency at the Marquee Club. There's... and Everything was sort of coming up and going well. So uh, Ultravox went to Ireland. Steve went to Ireland. We went to Ireland. Uh, one of our close buddies at the time was Eddie and the Hot Rods, and they went to Island Records. We did uh, an album there, and then we toured all through the winter with the vibrators up and down the M1 when everybody was, you know, spitting on you. You didn't have that in America. But in England, the English music press was very influential, and, and all of them had it out for the punks because they were all laid off prog rock musicians. Oh, <laughs> you know? wow. And we just put them out of business. So, right. You know, if you look at the, any of the reviews from that era, mm. you know, they're all uniformly mean spirited. You know, it's so interesting because here at that time, a lot of my friends, like the band Toto, they would get bad press from mm. the various critics because those critics were more in favor of the <laughs> punk scene as opposed to the more slicker rock scene. Yeah, well, that was slightly later because to begin <laughs> with, oh, the entire world was against us, you know. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it was very violent. Yeah. You know, you'd play a gig, you were more likely to get beaten up than paid. The music press had told everybody, well, what do you do at a punk gig? Well, you spit on your heroes. Oh. So, you know, up and down the bloody M1 with the vibrators, you come off every night coated in gob. Ooh. And what, why, what, att what attracted you to do this? A uh, bloody mindedness, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> when you're a kid and you believe you're right, you brook no opposition. Yeah. And that was kind of it. We went through situations that, you know, were absolutely insane. Like, we used to do these um, gorilla gigs. We'd rent a flatbed truck, a generator, put on a PA and turn up at gigs like Queen were playing at uh, Empire Pool Wembley. So overnight we had our guy go over there and we put out all these um, these posters. Tonight, Empire Pool Wembley, the automatics. And then at the bottom in very small letters, special guest Queen. <laughs> <laughs> As everyone came out of the Queen concert, you know, we rolled up in the parking lot playing when the tanks fell over Poland again and got you know, three or four numbers out before we were moved on. But the reviewer for the Evening Standard threw the review to us and said uh, how Queen were, you know, using all these tapes, whereas in the parking lot was a young band. I was talking with, with some guy who was his road manager like 20, 30 years later, and he said, that was you? Freddie was apoplectic. 
apoplectic. He wasn't happy? He was not happy. Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, it sounds like an exciting time. And many of the people that you worked with, you know, became legendary. And you mentioned the yeah, sex pistols. I, I, thought, I thought it was very, very bad form, <laughs> quite honestly. But, you know, you get to learn to live with it. It was an era that we... We will never have again. I mean, so I remember here in Los Angeles, it came on very strong, the whole the whole punk scene. There were clubs, there were bands. And me being a jazz, but mostly coming from jazz and studio music, I didn't acclimate to it. Mm. But when I met you and you played me some of your music, I instantly felt a kinship. Mm. And now I know it's your influence from the birds because <laughs> I was a huge birds fan going on. Yeah. You know? David, you're a wonderful lyricist. I, I have been quite impressed with the, the way you're wordsmithing. Oh, thank you. Would you tell us a little bit about your process writing lyrics? It's, it, it varies, of course. You know, I think it does for, 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 for most people. Mostly what I'm looking for is, you know, words the rhythm of words, the sound of words, the movie that's in them. And when I find something that captures my imagination, I put it down in, in, the, uh, in, a, in a notebook, you know, mm -hmm. and I probably don't do anything with it. <laughs> <laughs> Until, you know, later when I'm messing around with a riff and then I'll start chucking in ideas and, oh, and that, that line goes there that's maybe a hook and then other times i get this idea and then i start thinking well what's it about what belongs here and then i write it so the whole thing does vary i mean writing songs is a bit of a mystery i mean because i've worked really hard on writing songs and just come up dry mm -hmm. and then other times it's been like they've come as a gift mm -hmm. the more you do it the better you get and also just listening to the guys who really know what they're doing. Well, how did you come up with when the tanks roll into Poland? I was messing around with Mailman by Buddy Holly. Mailman, give me no more. You know, and that became the riff. Da -da 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 -da. I just sped it up. But the lyric, the, 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 the whole story of the tanks roll into Poland, how did that come about, the, getting that lyric, that idea? Well, I mean, there was a lot of a, a sort of right-wing posturing going on in the punk thing. So I was yanking their chain a little bit, you know. Uh, get right in on zero, there are no modern heroes, no messianic Nero to set the, the town aflame. So... I was thinking about what happens, how do we get to World War Three? And there were a lot of potentially dangerous situations going on at the time. Now, uh, I mean, at the time, I probably saw it as a, a piece of punk pop confectionery. But I think some people see it as prophecy now. Uh -huh. Some of your song titles, they have these kind of very captivating imagery like that. A radio blaring out from a burning car. Because I so much admire Jacques Brel, the French writer who also captivated David Bowie. You know, one of the things I loved about Jacques Brel was that he was appallingly translated. Mm. You know, he was, he was badly translated. And I came to love that about it. The old folks dream no more. Their little cat is dead. Their piano's out of tune. And no more do they sing on a Sunday afternoon. Mm. Brilliant. It, it's what you don't expect. There are several other song titles you have. Swan Dive Into the Void. How did you come up with that? I got diagnosed with cancer. That was a kind of a kick up the ass as a person, as a writer. And, you know, I was going into surgery and I started writing. It was the same thing as pulling the covers up over my head at boarding school and sticking in the earplugs. Oh. You know, so I started writing. That's the way that I process things. I'm a songwriter. And I thought, well, you know, what if it is, you know, into the void? Let's do it with a swan dive. You know it's over When the curtain comes down Another song of yours is The Jukebox of Human Sorrow. 
It's quite an image there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's the perennial complaints. You know, everyone's problems are generally fall into two categories, really, don't they? And so it's kind of repetitive. Romance and, and finance? <laughs> yes. I never wanted to concern myself with the perennial preoccupations of songwriters. There's a hundred other guys who can sing you, I love you, get your knickers off, love. <laughs> which is basically, you know, 90% of the songwriting effort. But I'm older now. Mm -hmm. I see things in a different way. And I process them in the same way through song. And so I want to write about the issues that I have at this point in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't want to funnel it into, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, great though that was. That was a moment. Yeah. Will you share with us some fond memories and stories of your days, you know, in, back in England, in, in the bands, in the clubs, in the studios? I'm sure you have a couple of favorites. Playing the marquee, I remember very well because they were really special moments where from the first downbeats, there was just this huge ignition going through the crowd and all the kids were jumping and there was a palpable excitement in the air. The allowance was like for 400 kids and if the clubs allowed 400, they'd packed 700 in there and they're all bouncing off the walls, you know, with kid energy. And, you know, all the uh, oxygen is being sucked out of the air. <laughs> yeah. You know, you need a little oxygen tank to get some air between the numbers. Uh, but, you know, the sweat would come off the bodies oh. and go onto the ceiling where it would cool and it would start raining in the building. So you're up there on stage and it's raining. Oh my God. And all the gear is getting wet and you're getting wet and everybody's chucking lager around. It's, you know. Wow. When you're a kid yourself, you just accept all these things. That's what gigging is. You, yeah. you know, I mean, that's all you know. Oh. That's normality. 30 years later, I go back to Japan. In England, when you're doing all those punk gigs or punk reunion gigs, you know, it's all the same guys that were there 30 years ago, but they're a whole lot fatter with a whole lot less hair. But in Japan, they were all kids again. Oh. You know, it's a whole new generation. I went over there in 2000 when it was the same thing in these little clubs with black walls covered in stickers and all these kids packed in there going crazy. Just this ignition of energy and it started raining again. Oh my gosh. And it just kind of reminded me because, you know, I hadn't seen that in 30 years. That is crazy. I want to ask you about the studio. Do you have any favorite memories of being in the studio or, you know, things that you learned or people that taught you or that inspired you? Island, St. Peter's Square. I mean, I remember going in there playing with Johnny Thunders on his album. And then Johnny Thunders came down and played on our album. You know, Johnny was was incredible, but, you know, he had uh, some issues with substance. There's one mix that Steve did of Johnny playing on Wild One. Johnny's there, you know, he comes to the solo, Johnny. Clunk. We look over. He's fallen over in the middle of the solo. Passed out? Passed out. Oh my God. So Steve put that in the mix and I wish I still had it. I probably, maybe I do somewhere, but I can't find it. Oh gosh. But uh, there was the Johnny Passes Out mix. So your latest song is called Weight of Dreams. It went straight to number one, you said. Yeah, well, in the 365 chart, yes. It, it, it was the first time that's ever happened to me. It, it's from my album, Star Maps of the Underworld. Where can we see the video? You can see it on YouTube after it's been premiered on the uh, Heritage Show. You know, this is kind of a renaissance time for you. You're doing really well on these charts on the same radio stations that you were listening to as a youngster. So then for the future, 
we're going to look for your life story, more new songs, more new recordings, and then, of course, pretty soon, our next recording together. Yes, which I'm looking forward to. Which I think we should do two songs. I think we should do one original and one cover. Okay. See how I, I always complicate it. We were going to start with one, and now it's going <laughs> to two. Pretty soon it'll be up to three. So if we're going to do a be, session, we have to do three songs. It'll be fun. It'll be okay. fun. Congratulations on your number one. Thank you, David. Fairy tales made into dreams Rarely ever all they seem Things are run against the grain Never really run in vain Living is easy with eyes closed Misunderstanding all you see Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, David Philp, for sharing a little piece of your life with us. And we look forward to putting out some great music together this year. Yeah. Let me take you down, cause I'm going to stop and leave yours. Nothing is real.